Um, so we're going to start, we're in 10.3, and I want to talk about slopes and tangent lines. Some interesting things happen with parametric equations with, with their, or can happen with their tangent lines. All right. So we have a, a smooth curve, and what we mean by smooth, there's, there's no cusp, there's no sharp corners, anything like that. It's a s uh, smooth curve. We'll get, we'll talk a in a little more detail about what we mean by smooth uh, a little later. And our smooth curve is given by x equals f of t and y equals g of t. So we have a set of parametric equations. And we want the slope of the curve at some particular coordinate, x, y. So I'm just going to take a, a, short, a short detour. We know from the chain rule that if, if a function is a function of uh, t, if a function is a function of x and x is a function of t, so we're going to say, I'm going to say in general, <coughs> df dt equals df dx over dx dt. So that's using the chain rule. That's how we're going to find find this this thing. So um, using that idea, we're going to say dy dx, which is going to give us our slope at any particular point, our derivative of of y with respect to x, is dy dt over dx dt. And we're going to say where <coughs> dx dt is not 0. We can, also, we can also show this using the definition of the derivative, taking limits as, as delta x approaches 0. Um, we can go through that, that, that argument. You get the, the, the same result. And the other way we could write this is um, dy dx equals, if we're looking at these, these equations, we could say f g prime of t over f prime of t. And the reason, the reason that I wrote this is when we start taking higher derivatives, we get kind of a, a it's kind of a not a, an asymmetrical situation. All right, so this does this make sense? This this idea the dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. So we continue this process. So for higher derivatives. Mostly we're going to be interested in the first derivative because we're interested in the slope of the tangent line. We might be interested in the second derivative of y with respect to x because we want to, t we want to figure out something about the concavity. So for d squared y, dx squared, second derivative of y with respect to x, this is the derivative with respect to x of dy dx. This is my function now. So by the chain rule, this is the derivative with respect to t of dy dx divided by dx dt. So we have, we have just the first derivative of x with respect to t in the denominator. Because this is the new function we're taking, we want the derivative of. The derivative of this function with respect to x is the derivative of this function with respect to t divided by dx dt. 
And if we continued, we would say the third derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative with respect to x of the second <coughs> derivative. And that would be the derivative with respect to t of the second derivative divided by dx dt. So we only have that first derivative of x with respect to t in the denominator. <coughs> All right, questions on, on derivatives? Be careful with this. We only have the dx dt in the denominator when we're dealing with higher derivatives with parametric equations. All right, so I want to do a quick example, and then we'll look at an interesting thing that can happen with parametric equations with their, with their tangent lines. And then we'll talk about vertical and horizontal tangents. All right, so we want to find the first and second derivative. Uh, for y equals 5 cosine t, sorry, x, y equals 4 sine t, for 0 less than or equal to t, less than or, uh, let's see, between 0 and 3. And then we want the slope and the concavity. at 5 squared root 3 over 2, comma 2. And this is x, y. Well, first off, let's think, what, what is this, what is, what is this curve going to be? Because these are different, it'll be an ellipse. It'll be close to a circle because 4 is kind of close to 5. Um, just like one is approximately zero. Um, all right, so dy dx, our, our first derivative, is dy dt over dx dt. Um, dy dt, or cosine t, dx dt minus 5 sine t. And I can write this as negative 4 fifths cotangent t. So that's our first derivative. Second derivative is the derivative with respect to t of, just writing these out, dy dx divided by dx dt. So the derivative of negative 4 fifths cotangent t. 4 fifths secant squared t divided by negative 5 sine t. And so I can write this as negative 4 20 fifths cosecant cubed t. Which, which part? The second so we took the derivative with respect to t of this, which is cosecant, derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. But we just divide by dx dt. <laughs> All right, so we also want the slope and concavity at 5 squared yeah. 3 over 2, comma 2. Yes? Why do you divide by dx? Um, so if I go back here, so let me start. In general, when we use a chain rule, the derivative of a function with respect to t is the derivative of a function with respect to x divided by dx dt. 
So when we want the second derivative of this, of this thing with respect to x, we want the derivative with respect to x of the function dy dx. Well, the derivative, so this is my function. The derivative of this with respect to x is the derivative of the function with respect to t divided by dx dt. So I, I can think of this as the derivative with respect to t of dy dx. We can kind of think of it as, and we're going to flip this and multiply, and the dt's cancel out. So this is the derivative of this thing with respect to x then. So that's right, right. And you keep, no matter what the higher derivative is, you're always the dx dt is always going to be the denominator. And then so it's just the derivative. Right, right. Um, all right. So we want the slope and concavity at five square root three over two. Five square root three over two, comma two. <laughs> so we need to figure out what t value to put in there. So I'm going to say at 5 square root 3 over 2 comma 2, co 5 cosine t, that's my x coordinate, equals 5 square root 3 over 2. So this tells me that cosine t is square root of 3, whoops, cosine t, square root of 3 over 2. And where is that? T equals pi over 6. Um, so my slope, dy dx, is minus 4 fifths cotangent of pi over 6. And do we remember? Cos so cotangent of pi over 6 is cosine over sine. So it's going to be square root of 3 over 2 over 1 half. And it's minus 4 square root of 3 over 5. And does that make sense on, on an ellipse at pi over 6? On ellipse at pi over 6, the slope would be negative? Yes. That, that, that makes sense, yeah? And we should ha it should be concave down as well, right? Um, so d squared y, the second derivative, dx squared, equals uh, minus 4 25ths cosecant cubed of pi over 6. And... That's minus 4 25ths, the cosecant of pi over 6. So it would just be 2 cubed, right? Because the sine is 1 half, so the cosecant is 2. So it would be 8, yes. So the concavity is minus 32 25ths. And we've figured that the concavity should be negative, it should be concave down. So our intuition and our calculations agree, <laughs> which is good. Right. If the number if the number is bigger, then it's more curved. Okay. And we'll t we'll talk more about that in chapter twelve. About curvature. Right, the sign. Um so one, one of the nice things that we'll do eventually, I was, what I was saying to Kira in chapter 12, we talk about curvature, and we'll quantify curvature. But for now, we would just say concave yeah. down negative. Right, and the concavity is that number. <laughs> All right, so an interesting thing that happens, questions on this example, just kind of, kind of tedious uh, computations. Um, because y is not a function of x,
That's one of the nice things about parametric equations. We can represent these other these kinds of curves uh, nicely that where y is not necessarily a function of x. Um, parametric curves can cross each other. So we can get we can get loops and various kinds of kinds of shapes with parametric curves. Um, and that means at uh, a particular point, <coughs> that was a the, that was a prolate cycloid. Um, at a point, a, a parametric curve can have more than one tangent line. So for example, uh, x equals 2t minus pi sine t, and y equals 2 minus pi cosine t. This is a prolate cycloid. So if I sketch a graph here, this is going to be a rough, a rough graph because my sketches often don't turn out beautiful and perfect. Um, so there's a rough sketch of uh, this prolate cycloid near the origin. And this point is 0, 2. So at the point 0, 2, we have two tangent lines. And I'm going to just tell you that 0, 2 uh, corresponds to t equals plus or minus pi over 2. And dy dx, our slope, is pi sine t over 2 minus pi cosine t. And at t equals pi over 2, dy dx is pi over 2. And at t equals negative pi over 2, dy dx, what do we guess? Negative. negative pi over 2. It's a nice symmetrical curve, so the slopes should be uh, opposite signs. And our tangent lines are, you can write the equation, y minus 2 equals pi over 2x, and y minus 2 equals negative pi over 2x. So we get two tangent lines there. And if I sketch them in here, just to visualize them, we get one kind of like this, and one kind of like that. So interesting, interesting property of, of uh, parametric curves is they can have two tangent lines, more than one tangent line. They could have more than two as well. Mm -hmm. They, yeah, just kind of like those the spirograph kind of things that keep going through a similar uh, one point. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about when we get uh, horizontal and vertical tangents. With um, with parametric curves, we're we're often going to be interested in horizontal and vertical tangents. 
Um, so we have x equals f of t and y equals g of t. If dy dt, equals zero. So the way I visualize this is we're not going up or down anymore. So dy dt is zero. And dx dt is not zero. We can still go side to side. So we're not going up or down, but we're going side to side. We get a horizontal tangent. And then we just switch these two around to get a vertical tangent. If dx dt equals 0, so we're not moving side to side anymore, but dy dt is not 0, so we're moving up or down, we get a vertical tangent. Um, if they're both equal to zero at the same time, then uh, we get we might get have a cusp or some some other kind of some some other kind of thing happening happening there with our curve. So this is how we determine when we have a horizontal and vertical tangent, and it's it's fairly intuitive. All right, questions so far. All right, um, I want to come up with, let's stay focused. I want to come up with a, a, a formula, an equation that we're going to need for next time, just to, to save ourselves a little bit of, a little bit of time. Um, so we're going to talk about um, arc length. This is part, this is what we're going to use in Monday's notes. Do we need to know the proof or just the, what do you think? Um, it is not a bad idea to know. <laughs> this is um, still 10-3. I just split it into two parts. All right, so if we have, so I'm going to say recall that if y equals, I'm going to say h of x, so we have an explicit function y equals f of x. The arc length. <laughs> that's right. Arc length of the curve is the integral. I'm just going to say from a to b of the square root of 1 plus h prime of x squared dx. Um, if, if our curve is given by x equals f of t and y equals g of t, And I'm going to say we need f prime to be positive. So we're um, we're moving we're moving uh, in the direction of increasing x on our curve. We can write. We're just going to substitute this in here. So I'm going to say x equals a to x equals b. The square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dt, sorry, dx. Well, and we just came up with an expression for dy dx. This is equal to the integral from a to b 
of the square root of 1 plus dy dt over dx dt squared dx. And I'm going to say that dx is dx dt times dt. So now I'm going to, inside the radical, I'm going to find a common denominator. So we get the integral from a to b of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared over dx dt squared. That's our common denominator. Times dx dt times dt. Well, what happens here? take the square root of the x to t squared in the denominator, what do I get? Yeah, in, the de in the denominator. Oh, which always yeah, cancels that. that. Weird. <laughs> Integral of a to b of, and I'm going to write this as f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared dt. So this is going to be our arc length formula in parametric, in parametric form. And it comes directly from our arc length formula in, in explicit form. And what we're going to do now, what we'll do eventually, is then apply this to polar coordinates and talk about how we find arc length in polar coordinates. And what we're saying here is close. Um, and we only want, uh, we want the curve to intersect itself only at the endpoints. So only if it intersects itself, it can only intersect itself um, if at the endpoints of the interval, at A and B. If it intersects itself in more than one place, we have to divide the integral into multiple pieces. Yes? If you like an ellipse, so a lot of times doesn't it just keep going around? Like we would say like from t equals oh. zero to t equals pi. But you could find the, the, the entire arc length. You could say we go from t equals 0 to t equals 2 pi, and you'd have the whole perimeter of the ellipse. All right, so we'll use this, we'll use this some more on, um, on Monday. We'll talk about arc length. We'll talk about surfaces of revolution in parametric, uh, parametric equations. Um, what else do we talk about on Monday? Surfaces of revolution, yeah, that's, that's, the two, that's our two topics. All right, homework. <laughs> Sorry, I got to look here because I can't read my handwriting. That is a nine. I, d I had to check. I could see. I could. I could have followed up on my joke. I could have said that's obviously a, obviously a nine, and then I would have had to check and say yes, it's obviously a nine. Yeah. 